I've come to the grounds of Hardwick Hall in the Bolsover district of Derbyshire. The hall itself would not be open for another two hours, however, so I decided to do my walk first. Good morning. It's Monday the 28th of November 2022 and I'm walking in the grounds of Hardwick Hall today. This is a place I've only ever really been to once before but it's a National Trust owned property so I'm making the most of my National Trust membership today. But the hall doesn't open until later. I think there's only two more days before the hall is actually closed for renovation and it's not opening until March I think it said. Anyway, it's very misty at the moment, so you can't really see the hall anyway. But uh, I'm going to do a walk first, and then when I finish, I'll go inside the hall and have a look round. Walking in a northwesterly direction, I came to a waymark, where a path went left into a wood. I carried on straight ahead, following the sculpture's walk. In a short while, I found myself approaching several ponds. Right, so I've got a bit of water coming up now then. I see a bit of water. I've had quite a lot of rain recently, which has been nice. So hopefully, it's restored a lot of the ponds that are in Derbyshire. This pond's looking full anyway. This is the lowest of the five row ponds, and just beyond it to my left, I walked around the Great Pond. So this is the Great Pond. On to the next pond. From the Great Pond, I followed a path with a waymark for the Miller's Walk. Passing through a car park, I approached Miller's Pond. So this is Miller's Pond. Despite the sound of the M1 just there, I'm not having to shout too much. <laughs> It's very pleasant. I think probably coming this time of year for me is the best time because uh, I just love the awesome colours. All the trees changing the colours with the leaves and stuff. But uh, yeah, very pleasant spot indeed. Today's walk is a route I've plotted myself. Um, it's calculated as about five to five and a half miles, and it takes about two hours. As always, it'll take me longer than that. But uh, yeah, I'm enjoying the little part of the walk I've done so far. It's nice to come somewhere different. I mean, there are a couple of villages that I'm going to be visiting on this walk, and I have been to those places before, but I've just not done a walk around here, so. Again, I'll get a whole new perspective of the area.
I began to climb up quite steeply through woodland, crossing the entrance drive to the park and continuing up Broad Oak Hill. At the top, I reached the Grange and went through a gate to follow a track. Oh, still quite misty at the moment. Don't know how long the mist is going to hang around for, but yeah, it's not spoiling the walk. So I'm just heading towards the lane now. So I just want to give a quick shout out to Andy Bennett. Hi, Andy. Um, I actually met Andy when I parked my car up this morning. Andy Bennett is a fencer, not a sword fencer. <laughs> a fencer, as in making these type of fences. But uh, yeah. Just as I'd parked my car up and was sort of starting my walk, Andy called across to me as he recognised me, so nice to meet you, Andy. The track was leading me in a north-easterly direction as I made my way towards the church tower I could see in the distance. I emerged onto a lane at Old Hucknall, often described as the smallest village in England, as it consists of only three houses and a church. St John the Baptist Church is a Grade 1 listed parish church, dating from the 11th century, with 14th and 15th century features. It was restored between 1885 and 1888 by William Butterfield. Well, a piece of luck, I've just walked past the church and the church warden happened to be coming up the pathway so he's very kindly let me in to have a quick look round so I'm very grateful, thank you very much. <laughs> That was really lovely. I timed that perfectly. I couldn't have timed that better, really. Just as I thought I couldn't get inside the church, because the gates before the door were locked, the church warden arrived. So he said, oh, do you want to have a look inside? I said, can I? <laughs> yes, please. So yeah, that was lovely. So uh, yeah, very kind of him to stop and let me in. I mean, he, he came here to do some work anyway, but uh, he just let me walk around inside the church and take a few shots. He lives in nearby Glapwell, so he's not got far to come. But yeah, that was really nice and really well timed. I'll get on my way now then, have a quick look around Old Hucknall, and then I'll move on with a walk. From the church, I headed east along the lane and where it curved to the left, I took a footpath straight ahead across a field, signposted to Rowthorne. I was actually planning today to film another walk in the Peak District, but at the last minute I decided to film this one instead. This was always on my to-do list, but uh, you know, to film at some point, I'm not sure when, but I just thought, well, let's do it today. And then I can do some other walks in Derbyshire after today that aren't in the Peak District. I'm just conscious of the fact that I do film a lot of walks in the Peak District, because it's a beautiful area. You know, it's, it's where I live, but there are also lots of nice walks that aren't in the Peak District that are in Derbyshire. I just thought today would be nice to do it, just to vary it a little bit, really. Having crossed Duke's Drive and walked through more fields, I was soon approaching the village ahead of me. I 
think Rowthorn is a beautiful little place. Very sleepy little settlement. Don't know how much traffic passes through. It is sort of a bit off the beaten track, really. It's been some years since I've last here. But I think today is the first time I've been here in my own time. Because, you know, in previous times, I've always been here when I'm working. So it's nice to come here in my own time and enjoy the village for what it is. There was once a railway station in Rowthorne, built by the Midland Railway, on the Barrow Hill to Plesley West Line, known as the Doe Lee Branch, because it ran for much of its length along the valley of the River Doe Lee. As I walked through this lovely village, I would soon be joining a short stretch of the Rowthorn Trail, which runs along part of the course of the aforementioned railway line. One thing that I'm particularly conscious of nowadays, which is an awareness that I've, I've gained through my experience of filmmaking, is when I'm out filming, particularly in a village where there's obviously houses, you know, residential properties, you've got to be very careful what you film and how you film it. Now, for example, just thinking about the fact that I've just come through Rowthorn now, I obviously took shots of the village to try and capture the village and how it looks, but what I don't want to be doing is standing my camera on the tripod directly out someone's house pointing at their front door or their window or whatever because understandably if anybody sees me inside their house pointing a camera at them they're going to wonder what I'm doing <laughs> so you've got to be very sort of careful the way you film things so I try and do it discreetly so that I'm not sort of pointing directly at someone's house but I am capturing the buildings in the village if I'm in places where there are a lot of people what I try and do, because, you know, you can't sort of stand around waiting for people to go. I mean, you'd be there till doomsday if you can do that. So there are days where you just cannot avoid having people in your shots. But what I try and do is if I'm in a place where there are lots of people, I try and shoot upwards. So if I'm in a building, so like later on when I go inside Hardwick Hall, I'll be filming in such a way where I will be trying my best not to film people and where possible, I'll probably be filming upwards so that you're filming above people's heads. So all little things like that I've got to consider when you're filming. At a signpost, I turned right off the Rowthorn Trail, taking a path in the direction of Teversal. I soon crossed the county boundary to enter Nottinghamshire, passing through woodland and across another field towards a cluster of houses. The path emerged onto a lane, along which I turned right. Heading back towards Hardwick Core now. Yeah, I've done most of the walk now. So it's pretty good. Not a particularly strenuous walk. And the beauty is, I wouldn't say it's sunny, but it's getting a bit brighter. I think the main thing is the mist has gone. So at least now, when I do get back to Hardwick Hall, I should be able to see it. <laughs> Crossing back into Derbyshire, I took a path leading back into the Hardwick Estate as I walked through Lady Spencer's wood. Soon, I was back where I had started my walk. Well, it's a feeling of deja vu. <laughs> I've had to walk through the entrance again like I did first thing this morning when I arrived. 
course, I came to him this way. They had to scan my National Trust membership card. But of course, doing the walk, I've come all the way back round and I had to go through the entrance again. So <laughs> the guy on the gate said, uh, hey, you'll be ready for your coffee and cake now, then won't you? He said, I said, definitely. Well, it won't be coffee for me. It'll be tea, tea and cake. But let's look at the house first. I took off my muddy walking boots, put on my trainers, and headed towards the entrance of Hardwick Hall. Positioned high on an escarpment, dominating the skyline of this part of Derbyshire, Hardwick Hall is a rare 16th century survival built and resourced from the estate by local people. Home to one of the most influential women in the Elizabethan realm, Hardwick Hall is the culmination of the personality and ambition of its builder and patron, Elizabeth, Countess of Shrewsbury, known as Bess of Hardwick. The glorious gardens include the fragrant herb garden ornamental and fruiting orchards, and a spectacular border of herbaceous plants. A great place to grab a deck chair and take a moment to relax in its wonderful surroundings. I'm going to have a, a brief look inside the house. I have been here before, but uh, it's about 20 past two now. It's probably quite a good time to come inside and have a look around because it's probably crowds have probably sort of dispersed by now. That was a lot quieter. Yeah, I think the house actually closes at three anyway, so I've got plenty of time to have a quick look around. Near original interiors allow us a glimpse into this exceptional moment in English design. They hold an internationally significant collection of 16th century textiles, furniture and portraits, reflecting the quality of craftsmanship, cultural mix and complex relationships of the Elizabethan age. One thing I do like about Hardwick Hall and a lot of these old houses are the same. Just love all these quirky little passages. And staircases. They just sort of give the place its character. sitting in my small flat with a little table in the corner. <laughs> Can always get a hundred people around this table. Wow. Well, that was really lovely. This is the thing I've said before, it's so worth being a member of the National Trust. I pay six pounds a month. I'm not, actually, I'm not sure how much it is to get in here as a one-off for being a non-member, but if you sort of like pay as a non-member to come three or four times a year to different National Trust properties, you've probably spent more than if you were just to become a member for a year. So it really is worth being a member. And you can come in as many times as you like and just see so many of these fantastic places. Next to the hall is Hardwick Old Hall, managed by English Heritage. 
which is currently closed for conservation. Typical, the sun's come out at the end of the day. <laughs> it's quarter to three now, so, but uh, I've finished for the day now. I suppose it's nice to end on a high, isn't it? Now, I'm gonna go for my tea and cake 